very much for joining me on this Cinema Showcase and joining me in welcoming my guest, Kenneth Bradham. Thank you very much for being here. It's good to see you. My pleasure, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. As I said in the introduction, uh, your film of Henry V is a magnificent experience. Well, thank you. It is, um, uh, it's moving. Uh, it's, it's everything I suppose I hoped it would be. Um, I suppose the first thing I really want to ask you is what, um, what prompted you to, to choose this as the subject for a film in which you would not only star but adapt from Shakespeare and direct? Well, a number of things. Um, when I came to read the play for the first time uh, properly, when I was at drama school, I was at the Royal Academy in London, and uh, I read it and had a half-remembered vision of the Laurence Olivier film, which carried very vivid images of a kind of knights in shining armor world, a kind of Camelotian kind of look. Very picture book, very technicolor, very bright. I read the play and I felt a much darker kind of world. There was a I realized then that there were certain things that Laurence Olivier's wartime version had removed, which to me were very significant about the character of the king himself. And once they were restored, it had uh, terrific um, uh, implications for the other characters. And it seemed to me there was a very uh, youthful story there about a very young man's uh, journey to, towards some kind of maturity, which, which arrives, you know, on the eve of the Battle of Agincourt, and that there's a very good, very suspenseful tale, a kind of seat of the pants, what happens next kind of tale on the way there that um, could get some, some, some new juice, um, you know, 50 years on from, mm -hmm. from wartime Europe. Um, it, seemed, it felt like a very rich mixture and uh, added to that the visual possibilities of something as, that has this emotional story and yet a kind of epic uh, dimension because it's about uh, wars and countries and things. All those possibilities, I mean, just to me felt like it, they would make a marvelous modern film. And I, I played it for a while on stage with the Royal Shakespeare Company in 1984, and that made me feel very strongly that it was very much a piece for our times, mm -hmm. and that it, that it raised lots of interesting questions about the nature of leadership and, you know, the whole morality of war, as well as being on one level a great big adventure story, sure. which is very moving, so yeah. all those reasons, really. Yeah, it, it certainly does work on many levels, and um, were you at all, was it a, a somewhat a daunting experience to, uh, to do all of those things at once, to direct, to act, to adapt? Yeah, it was, um, in, in many ways, it, it, it was, uh, in a sense, I took my leave from the fact that Sir Laurence Olivier had, had done those things himself um, beforehand in the spirit of his, whatever you'd call that, effrontery or boldness or temerity, which ran right through his career, was something that, um, you know, I've tried to employ, it, it, the, the ability to take risks. Um, I'd never set out to be a film director, um, I'd always considered myself an actor, but there are certain projects where one's involvement is such that with this one, my, my interest was so much in being involved with the overall atmosphere of the piece, with the overall gesture of the film, um, you know, with the desire to be ultra-realistic, to make it sound as much like naturalistic dialogue as possible without fighting the poetry that can give it such a special dimension. Being realistic about the, you know, the place, medieval Europe, castles, torch-lit, smoke, a dark world, it must do things to people's characters. I was interested in that overall view. I had a very strong view of how I wanted to present the battle, which was not going to be with great big epic shots of anonymous groups of people moving around. I wanted to get in there and show the battle. Mm -hmm. And those things I felt even more passionately, actually, than wanting to play the central part. And if, if I'd had to give up one of those things, then it would have been uh, giving up acting the role. Mm -hmm. the, the cutting of the piece and the shaping of the piece seemed to me to be innately involved with the direction of it, with the whole kind of mood of the piece. So things that I cut were things like some of the Elizabethan jokes that I, I think just ain't funny anymore, you know, <laughs> things that were, you know, a, a gas for a week in 1599, but just ain't so topical no more. So um, some of those went, and, and the, 
what I wanted to emphasize, I, I don't feel that I twisted anything particularly, but it is a version of the play, uh, was the kind of political thriller. And so all of those things, all those things which, yeah, were daunting all together, but, but they kind of evolved organically, if you like. So it, it seemed to be just the natural way to approach realizing this version. So as a, as a filmmaker, I made a film, you, um, you knew how you wanted this film to look and feel, you knew the atmosphere you wanted before the camera turned. I, on an instinctive level, yeah. I mean, I had, it was like, a, you know, someone who has a, some kind of ear for music, but may, may not have all the kind of technique right. at their fingertips. But I knew if I had the right people around me, that all those areas, those gaps in my experience, technical experience, would be hopefully filled in, and that my relative lack of experience, but strong instinct, would allow other people to have a big input. So the designer and the lighting cameraman, in fact, did, because um, I presented them with a lot of problems. Uh, where I'd simply say, well, I don't know how you do it, but that's what I want. Right. I, don't, I don't know how you do it. And they, so, I, I mean, I, it, it wasn't a question of doing that aggressively. They, they, were, they were then challenged by, I mean, the director of photography said, the great thing is you don't change your mind. Um, and they gave me a lot of kind of credit for knowing the play so well. Most people on, on the picture hadn't worked on a Shakespeare film before. They're relatively rarely done. The last big one probably, I'm sure you'll know more about it than I, but the, it was probably the Polanski Macbeth in 71, mm -hmm. I think sure. that was, and, and then maybe before that the Zeffirelli, Romeo and Juliet. So they gave, you know, I, I was as new to it as they were um, as far as filming Shakespeare was concerned, and it required a kind of style that blended theatricality with the the medium we always wanted to make a film not a filmed play right but we still wanted a kind of scale that some films just aren't used to doing so you know we, we try and at various times the very the very first entrance of the king we give you know some scale to big doors opening uh, a few shots nicked from a, the odd Russian film or two <laughs> silhouette, you know, big doorway, walk down, you know, dramatic music and things. And then in the chair sits this wee boy mm -hmm. who happens to be running England. And so we always wanted the simplicity and the human side of getting in quite close to real people, not people from playland, right. but real people, matched with occasionally simple but powerful and big images, size. Sometimes people on the crew were resistant to that. They thought, oh, God, this is, is this getting too big? Is this, you know, are you, are you getting theatrical here? But it, it seemed to me that we needed to develop a style that was, that, that, that was as special and as uh, unique as Shakespeare is, but that kept, uh, kept a reality mm -hmm. that was kind of all of a piece. And all of that, I guess, was instinctive. And I, I've been watching movies since as long as I can remember. Yeah. I'm Mr. Mr. Buff. Yes. So, I mean, uh, there are a lot of, um, I suppose the polite word is homage is being paid to lots of people <laughs> in there. Other people would call it plagiarism. But, I mean, I think everybody borrows things oh, and sure. makes them their own. Oh, sure. I've certainly done that. It is. It's, it's an astonishingly beautiful film to look at. I've, I don't know what, what your budget was. I've read several accounts anywhere from um, two million pounds to eight million pounds. I don't suppose budget is really relative, but... Uh, Nine million dollars is what it worked out really? at the end, yeah. Well, when, when the audience sees this film, uh, what, <laughs> what you have on the screen for nine million dollars is truly amazing. Oh, well, it I'm looks like a film so. that, that cost three times that much. Oh, well, I'm glad, that, 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 I'm glad you say that. I mean, we, we put in as much detail, as much preparation mm -hmm. as we could, and everything is on screen. There's no... Uh, you know, we didn't, there wasn't stuff we, we didn't use, right. it's all up there, yeah. You know, in a sense, <clears throat> I suppose you, you were in the, in the same position that Laurence Olivier was back in 44 when he did his version because he had never directed a film before, mm. and the whole thing was new to him, so cool. I'm sure he was very much, um, and that, that really brings me to another point, um, I'm sure, or I'm guessing, there have been some critics perhaps before they have seen your film, who have said, uh, or, or who have suggested, you know, uh, how dare you remake um, Henry V, it's already been done, that mm. sort of thing. Most certainly. Uh -huh. um, to my way of thinking, though, this is in no way showing any um, disregard for either Laurence Olivier whom I just take for granted, you agree, was 
one of the greatest oh, of all actors. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and a great filmmaker, but rather a, um, a different interpretation because the play, because Shakespeare on stage is, is interpreted and reinterpreted all the time. Sure, and is, and is as rich as that and can bear different kind of ex examinations. And um, I, I think some people in England felt that I was going to be burning copies of Laurence Olivier's film when mine was released. <laughs> the fact is, it is there. Magnificently, it is there. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people actually watch this film and go back and get the Olivier version sure. uh, out on video. I think we'll have swelled the, sell the, <laughs> the sales of that video considerably. Um, no, I, I mean, I, I, I hope nearly 50 years on from that, that film that this one is so dramatically different that it, it is a, 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 a complementary version one that allows us to see quite different um, bits of the play that are possible to be explored um, because, you know, uh, we've moved on 50 years in cinema technique, in acting techniques, um, acting styles, um, and in what audiences kind of, you know, expect from a, from a movie. And we, 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 we do everything dramatically different, and, and so it's for now, in the same way that, you know, it can live for now in the same way that different performances of, say, Hamlet or Henry V in the theatre or Romeo or mm. any of those parts can be seen uh, and people want to see them um, done by different people because just like an audience was, will respond quite differently to a piece of work, so actors will bring different things. And uh, that kind of, you know, proprietorial element over, say, Olivier's film, which I'm sure he would resist, He'd be, I'm sure he was Mr. Realist, he, you know, uh, uh, he was Mr. Popular and Mr. Commercial, just like Shakespeare. Sure. They would both resist this kind of um, churchifying of, of, you know, <laughs> this uh, kind of over-reverential thing. Because as soon as you start doing that, you put things, they stop living. Yeah. They're suddenly they're in museums and things, and, and uh, that's, you know, at all times we were trying to present this for an audience now, uh, and as wide an audience as possible. To not exactly take the mystery out of Shakespeare, but, well, I guess you were trying to, to do both. You were trying to retain the mystery and take some of the mystery away. Sure, to be contemporary and traditional, yeah. to, to, um, to uh, we, we, you know, we're getting close with folk, we've taken license with uh, costume detail and with military detail. Purists who want to know that there were 17 buttons on the Herald's jacket in 1415 may well find that because I've simply made it a blue jacket, because he's <laughs> French, that that's, that's offensive to their sensibilities. For me, it helps storytelling, and what we're trying to get is an essence of medievalism, but, uh, as you know, with various battle sequences at the Siege of Harfleur, we have trenches there. It's redolent of other conflicts. The right. way we do the battle is redolent of other conflicts, and that's deliberate to just say this play is not some kind of medieval history lesson. It's message and it's discussion of this, this, this thing that we continue to do, which is go to war. Yeah. Um, it, the, the, Shakespeare's analysis of it is as pertinent today as it was 400 years ago, but it was written 400 years ago, so it would be mad not to be aware of how people watch films now, what they're used to, and to find some way of presenting it that simply opens it up, doesn't reduce it, but opens it up, you know, doesn't, un but doesn't underestimate an audience's intelligence either. Mm -hmm. It's not a question of patronizing them. We haven't changed the words, we've right. cut some bits. We've used the techniques of cinema. We've tried to move it along. We've given, you know, as much visual elan as we can to it, and we try and make that, we, we, we get away from declamatory acting. There's no right. operatic, um, you know, here's me being proper kind of mm -hmm. acting. It's, we're up there, you know, so people need to speak like they'd speak. Exactly. Um, and you can still do that, and with really skilled and experienced actors, you can do that and still get that special tingle down the spine kind of thing that Shakespeare gives you, especially yes. in this play where the, it's a kind of irresistible emotional tug. By the time you get to the eve of Agincourt and Henry's delivering, delivering the uh, St. Crispin's Day speech, it's very hard not to be caught up in, yes. the, uh, in the emotionalism of it. And, uh, and I require that from, from, from movies. I like mm -hmm. to get involved. Mm -hmm. I like to be emotionally involved. And this one packs a powerful punch. I mean, the story, not necessarily yeah. what we've done, but it. It was so so many things in the film that were um, tremendously effective but mentioning mentioning the battle for 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 some reason and I suppose it's the, the reality you're speaking of with which you treated it when um, when you're carrying 
uh, the, the lad off mm -hmm. is just one of the most vivid and, and, and moving and um, maddening scenes too. Yeah, well, uh, we were trying to get everything in there. But it, during the battle, we try and get in close. We try and make people feel what it was like. The eyewitness accounts of the Battle of Agincourt describe a kind of scrum that is unbelievable. It's like a butcher shop. It wasn't all Errol Flynn heroics. It was people, their bit of battle was two or three square feet around them. They would hack and hack and hack, and he who hacked longest won. And it was, it was savage. I guess a lot of them killed each other. Mm -hmm. You know, the French killed the French. A lot of French died because they fell on top of each other. There was a terrible squash. People suffocated. There were piles of bodies six feet high. And they were falling over in heavy armor, couldn't get up. And this rain of arrows raining in on them. We wanted to be in there and, and, uh, and save our revelation of what this all cost until the end and start very, very quietly and then just provide a shot and a kind of emotional cathartic thing for the audience. It's as if our, we need to feel as though we've gone through it and it's all been squeezed out because I think every, it produces something in people, an audience watching it. We wanted to make people feel they were there so that their emotions were very close to the surface. And then the, the weariness and the kind of nothing more to sayness about the end of a battle, uh, we wanted to capture. and. Um, and do it musically and graphically, and produce everything that, that is the end of a battle. If, if you've only been in close and seen people squashed up, then the end of it uh, is, is people clearing up, bodies being dragged away, people looting bodies, people stealing bits of armor, women from the local village screaming at you to, you know, why did you do this? Horses, um, you know, lame, fires happening, and we wanted to get it all and not cut into that shot and yes. also to accompany it with the music that uh, again taps into this extraordinary um, uh, atmosphere that is produced when you're that near death yes. and you've just got away with it. You know, the kind of anthems from the First World War, you know, pack up your troubles and your old kit bag, that, that kind right. of tune plus the sort of anthem quality of something like Land of Hope and Glory was what we were after in the music and the whole effect being to really just raise this enormous question mark over why, how, was it worth sure. it, is it worth it, and it, 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 um, it I, we were just trying to plug into what I think Shakespeare was trying yeah. to say there and make it work with the cinema. We have a scene from the film that I want the, uh, the audience to, since you mentioned the music though, that I, I, must, I must come in and this is one of the most brilliant scores I've heard in a long time. Now, the score by Pat Doyle is just absolutely Magnificent. Uh, well, I'm glad and, he and deserves so, so. an Academy Award, I think. Well, I hope that he gets a nomination because uh, it's a marvelous... Uh, he worked uh, night and day that, uh, on, on finding this balance, which we were trying to find, between um, just serving up, this, serving up this old language for a new audience. And one of the ways we could do that was to get music that just got you immediately. Mm -hmm. And uh, he achieves that remarkably well. well so. Speaking of nominations, I, I think... Um, I think I can safely say that um, the film is in for about 10 or 12 of them. Well, that would be great. Uh, Fingers crossed. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's take a look right now at a scene from Kenneth Branagh's film of Shakespeare's Henry V. It's certain there's not a boy left alive. Oh, <laughs> I was not angry since I came to France! Until this instant! Here comes the herald of the French, my liege. <laughs> what means they tell out? Eh? Come flow again for ransom! Three king! I come to thee with challenge of all license. That we may wander o'er this bloody field to book our dead and then to bury them. To sort our nobles from our common men. For many of our princes, all the while I drowned and soaked in mercenary blood. I'll give us leave, great king, to view the field in safety and dispose of their dead bodies. I tell thee truly, Herald, I know not if the day be ours or no. The day is yours.
A scene from Henry V, directed by and starring my guest, Kenneth Branagh. Let me ask you a question that um, has been debated on both sides of the Atlantic for years and years, and that's the two general styles of acting that, that are attributed to, um, I suppose, New York and, and London. What is your... First of all, do you think there is a, a, a basic difference between what has come to be known as the method, as personified by Brando and so forth, and the more or less classical approach that we think of as being particularly British? I think the um, film like this throws that thing up in the air, that, 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 that question up in the air, because I, I was trying to find in order to maintain this this notion of accessibility for this film to keep opening it up and allowing it to cross over into you know a whole audience area that w wouldn't necessarily um, go for it and perhaps be put off by the acting by a kind of standoffish acting and I guess um, there is a tradition of English acting which at its worst could be said to be cold and technical um, and similarly at the other extreme there's a there is a kind of American method acting, which I would describe as uh, over emotional, <laughs> sloppy, <laughs> and, and yeah, I guess and, and sloppy. Mm -hmm. There is some halfway house that uh, I admire a lot of uh, uh, American film acting. I admire its truthfulness, um, and I think there's no reason why American actors shouldn't do Shakespeare very well on stage or on film. I think the crucial difference is the size of the countries and therefore the 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 relative. Um, degree of opportunity. English actors have more chance to practice Shakespeare, for instance, because it's done more often. Um, and so they have a, a leg up, but they don't get as ch a chance to do as many films. For me, the best acting combines the emotional fearlessness of American acting and the technical uh, uh, ability of, of, of English acting. I never want to see technique. I never want to see it ever. But you see, a film like this throws up an interesting thing. I wanted it to be raw. I wanted it to be passionate and emotional. But at the same time, I wanted everybody to be able to hear everything. I wanted it to be crisply delivered. But I didn't want people to be aware of people articulating sure. or enunciating. But I wanted a kind of, you know, I wanted that kind of uh, the drive and the kind of passion and everything that you'd get in a, in a raw American performance. But I, exactly. I just wanted, I wanted it to be as disciplined as to, you know, for when Henry says things, this, this revolt of thine is like another fall of man. I wanted phrases like that to ring out, you know, with a thickness of meaning that they have. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, because that's, I mean, you, you understand that he's upset, you know, but I, you know, I'd be upset easily, you know, but I'd like to be upset and, and, and I'd like you to get a great line right. of poetry. So, it needs, I think you can do that without compromising. I think you can do that without becoming some kind of technical actor who starts being, you know, sort of over, I can't bear that kind now of Now I'm acting. going to act for yeah. you. Yeah, you know, proper acting, as it were. But, and I, and I can't bear for a whole because you say, well, sorry, what do you mean? What are you talking about? So I don't know what you're talking about. So there's, there's two extremes are, are yeah. wild and wacky and equally bad, I think. Sure. Um, so there's a halfway house. I won't ask you if you've had any um, any um, acting idols growing up, but are there actors whose performances you, be it on film or stage or whatever, that you always tried to watch if you could or, or whatever? Yeah, there have been lots of them, lots and lots of them. Um, 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 uh, Pacino uh, is a favorite actor of mine. Uh, I saw him, he, just the Godfather films and Dog Day Afternoon particularly mm -hmm. is a marvelous performance, I think. The, the, the ensemble acting in The Godfather, I think, yes. uh, has hardly been bettered in any American movie. It's so real and, and juicy and uh, just so many marvelous, marvelous performances. A great American performance I liked, I, you, uh, now I, I saw this very young, but it made a big impression on me, was Burt Lancaster in The Birdman of Alcatraz. Yes. Great performance. Um, and I just loved that, and that was one of the first performances that made me kind of disarmed me completely because I'm watching this movie and this man seems utterly real and it was a great yarn as well so it's a marvelous story but he was so good he's also great in Sweet Smell of Success yes with yes. Uh, Tony, Tony Curtis, Curtis one of the best things Tony Curtis ever <coughs> did as well things like that what about your favorite British actors 
British actors, I like uh, Anthony Hopkins very much. Mm -hmm. I like that kind of danger. I love Olivia. Olivia is just, is always so ultra kind of watchable. Um, I like a lot of the stuff Michael Caine's done. Yeah, the, 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 in between, you know, he suddenly does a wild film and then he does, he, can do, he really surprise. he continues to surprise you. As does Sean Connery. Yes. People who kind of really mature and they, their, their work seems to get better and better. Yeah. Um, there's yeah. a lot of good performers around. There are so many. We are out of time. This has been a fast half hour, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Very much. Thank you. And I urge everyone to see this, this stupendous film you have made, and um, I certainly hope you will continue to not only uh, act for us, but uh, direct as well. Thank you very much. My thanks to Kenneth Browner for being on this in the Michelle case, and my thanks to you for watching. Until next Record of over five...